the Anglo-Boer War had a significant impact on the mining industry, leading to capital losses due to closures. A social division of labor emerged in which skilled and supervisory roles was held by whites. While unskilled labor was held by African and colored workers who were paid less. When unemployed whites surged to the city's post-war, divisive labor policies by mine owners to maintain the racial hierarchy was introduced. Industrial and labor disputes were common between 1907 and 1922, with strikes by white miners protesting the use of black labor and the importation of Chinese contract workers to fill post-war labor shortages. Between February and December 1920, the bullion declined from 130 shillings per ounce to 95 shillings per ounce. Mining operators announced they would lose most of their operations if production were cut. As a result, they had to restructure 10,000 white miners and thousands of blacks. The Chamber of Mines proposed to lower wages for workers by abolishing the color line and increasing the ratio of black to white workers. Although the wages of white workers had risen by 60% since World War I, while black wages have risen by only 9%. In the early days of mining Africans did not possess the skills necessary for deep-level mining, therefore, the division of the workforce had been between black laborers and white management. The custom that skilled work was done by white men had been reinforced by legislation. When Chinese laborers were introduced under the Milner regime following the Boer War. During World War I the overall ratio of white to black workers had been maintained. As time passed, however, black miners began to acquire the skills required for deep-level mining, although their wages remained at lower rates. In September 1918, white mine workers succeeded in persuading the Chamber of Mines to agree that no position filled by a white worker would be given to black or colored workers. When the Chamber of Mines gave notice that it would be abandoning the agreement in 1921 and would be replacing 2,000 semi-skilled white men with cheap black labor, the white miners reacted strongly. Their jobs and wages were threatened by the removal of the color line. With sporadic strikes breaking out by white workers throughout 1921, these strikes would become more widespread by year-end. Trade unions were already active in Fordsburg due to the large number of miners and workers. This led to the Fordsburg Rebellion, with some union members focusing on community empowerment while others joining the communists known as the Reds. With W. H. Andrews, known as Comrade Bill, leading the communists and calling for a general strike. With revolutionary commandos or Red Commandos under the Federation of Labor being formed. In the new year, strikes began in the Transvaal collieries which quickly spread to the gold mines of the reef. With the largest strikes taking place on the East Rand. By the 10th of January, work stoppages in mining and related industries were complete. Labour Party MP Bob Waterstone proposed a provisional government and to declare a South African Republic. But the National Party leader Thielman Roos rejected this idea at a parliamentary conference in Pretoria. Roos made it clear that the National Party would not support a revolt. In February 1922, negotiations with the South African Industrial Federation broke down, leading to violence orchestrated by the Action Group. White men armed themselves and attacked black and colored men in Johannesburg, prompting the declaration of a general strike that escalated into a revolution. The Red Commandos took advantage of the chaos, confiscating firearms and inciting further violence. The Union Defense Force was deployed to suppress the rebels, who had taken control of Brackpan and engaged in intense battles for Benoni and Springs. With police garrisons in Brackpan and Benoni under siege, with the South African Air Force dropping supplies by air and bombing the rebels. Martial law was declared, and Berger commandos were mobilized, as the situation spiraled out of control. Rebels attacked security forces and civilians, blaming Prime Minister Jan Smuts for the unrest. The Imperial Light Horse and Transvaal Scottish suffered heavy losses in ambushes. The Red Rebels continued their violence, targeting perceived supporters of mine management and law enforcement. General Smuts would arrive and take over command to restore order. On March 12, military forces and armed citizens attacked the rebels at Brixton Ridge, capturing 2,200 prisoners. Government troops led by General Van Deventer relieved the besieged police garrisons in Brackpan and Benoni the following day. 
On March 15, artillery bombarded the strikers' stronghold at Fordsburg Square, leading to the fall of the revolution to government forces. Communist leaders Fischer and Spendifu alive themselves, leaving a note declaring they died for their cause. Samuel Alfred Longmore Taffy, seen as a working-class martyr, was arrested and charged with murder, high treason, and possession of stolen goods after the defeat at Fordsburg. On March 16, the Union Defense Headquarters stated the revolt was a social revolution organized by Bolshevists, international socialists, and communists. The revolt was officially declared over on Saturday, the 18th of March. With government troops continuing to clear areas, conducting house-to-house -house searches and making arrests of suspected Reds until the 19th of March. The Rand Revolt was a devastating event that resulted in numerous casualties, damage to property and economic losses. Approximately 200 people, including many police officers, were killed, and over 1,000 individuals were injured. Including civilian bystanders. 15,000 men were left unemployed, and gold production declined. Some of the rebels were deported, while a few were executed for their actions. John Garsworthy, leader of the Brackpan Red Commando, was initially sentenced to death but was later exonerated. For communist leaders were executed, defiantly singing the red flag anthem on the gallows. Prime Minister Smuts faced backlash for his harsh response to the revolt, leading to his defeat in the 1924 election. This allowed the Nationalist and Labour parties to form a pact, resulting in white miners accepting unfavourable conditions to increase gold production. The government faced growing pressure to protect skilled white workers in mining and manufacturing as South Africa's industrialization continued. Union Defence Force units that was mobilized against revolutionaries include the Durban Light Infantry, Railways and Harbours Brigade, Witwaters and Rifles, Rand Light Infantry, Imperial Light Horse, Transvaal Horse Artillery, Transvaal Scottish, South African Service Corps, South African Medical Corps, South African Air Force. Note that the Whippet Tank HMLS Union was at the time in service with the Air Force. Thank you for watching. Please consider to like and subscribe.